Good morning, oh, fellow see. Toastmasters. How are you? I call this meeting of Lake Mary Toastmasters Club 6442 order. Before we proceed, please silence your cell phones, which I need to do as well. Thank you, I appreciate it. I would like to ask everyone to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Our club mission is to provide a supportive learning experience in which members are empowered to develop communication and leadership skills, resulting in greater self-confidence and personal growth. And even with a low attendance, I don't think of it as being low, I think of it as being well trimmed. <laughs> I would like to present to you our Toastmaster today. Yay. There we go. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> as we prepare, whether you, you may or may not go, but this weekend, the big sporting event. Actually, it's one of the <laughs> In combination, I just realized, other than the, the, the Mayweather-Pacquiao boxing match going on, which has been years and years and years in the making, a very highly anticipated boxing match, it's also the Kentucky Derby. So it's one of the, they're saying it's one of the biggest sporting, if you're a sporting fan, it's supposed to be a, a fantastic day. And I, was there, I even read an article the other day about packages, that if you wanted to do both in one day, they have private jet charters that will take you. So you can go watch the Kentucky Derby, then get you in Las Vegas in time. In time. Of course, uh, at a very steep price, <laughs> those packages come to. I think that the first one started at about, just for the flight, was $11,000 just to get you in time for the Kentucky Derby over to Las Vegas. For those who don't know, this fight has been years in making, and it is expected to break records. It's going to double the amount uh, made by any previous boxing match. They're, they're expected to split about $300 million in winnings. It's supposed to have record pay-per-view revenue, oh, doubling what happened last year, or what happened three years ago in the Mayweather-Canelo fight. That one brought in the record, and that was at $75 for a pay-per-view. Pay-per-view matches for this one are going up $99. Each are expected to bring in over $200 million just in pay-per-view, uh, uh, revenue from pay-per-view fights. And I, when I calculated it out, it's 12 rounds, pretty much around it, they'll be making about $4.2 million a minute during the fight, or $70,000 every second. Which day is this day? Uh, Saturday night. What day is this day? Well, May 2nd. Who, who they? Oh, Pacquiao, May Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather. They, they're the ones actually. Yeah, yeah, they they're splitting three hundred million dollars between the two, and we'll get into a breakdown of where all those different money sources come from, and a little bit more about them after we introduce and hear a little bit from our technical table this morning. So first, I'd like to start out with our grammarian for today, Julia Kaufman. Good, I'm glad you're here. Yay. Millions of people will be watching Saturday. Wallop means to strike, to land a physical blow. So try using that in your your language if you speak and if you <laughs> and if you don't, you'll be charged a quarter. The other role is to listen for a good use of the English language and not so good uses of the English language. I'll give my report at the end of the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. We have our timer and Mike Hughes. All right. All right. You got five to seven. You get the green card at five, yellow at six, red at seven. And I uh, will deal with more later, more table topics for 30 seconds and then not go in. So, that is my function. Up today, pulling double duty as Sergeant Arms and, uh, and, uh, and all counter is Sam Bailey. Mm -hmm. Yes, that one was quite a wallop. Uh, 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 uh,
function to listen for the use of filler words such as ah, you know, so, okay, and other audio pauses as fillers. I will notify if a, or noting if a member before any double clutches, which means to say things twice, such as, stop it. <laughs> stop. This means, this means <laughs> finally, I will include things, or include the things which might be distracting, such as lip smacks. I will present my reports during the evaluation portion of the meeting. So as you're watching the fight this weekend, if you don't know a lot about these, these boxers, you might want to, just to give you some more background on each one of them. They're both very uh, interesting personalities, you say, and, and completely polar opposites. One's very kind of uh, respectable, meek type of individual, and the other one is extremely in your face, arrogant, and likes to flash money around all over the place. So we'll start out with, with him, Mr. Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> <laughs> he is known for just throwing his money around. He's actually the highest paid athlete in the world uh, by far. He, he, made, he made $90 million alone in 2013, and he did this without any endorsements. He has no endorsement deals, and no Nike, no Under Armour, anything like that, because he has his own clothing company. Uh, it's called, his brand is called The Money Team. <laughs> and it's called TM, uh, TMT, so anytime you see a TMT initial, even, even uh, Warren Buffett has been known to hang out with Floyd Mayweather and, and wear The Money Team hats <laughs> and, and gear. <laughs> Just some instances of, of Floyd Mayweather's extravagant spending is he has two fleets of cars, one in Miami and one in Las Vegas, and they're all color-coded. All of his cars in Miami are white, all of his colors, cars in Las Vegas are black. He only wears shoes and underwear once, and then leaves them for hotel staff <laughs> to take with them if they'd like. He takes two jets everywhere he goes because he's afraid of, of weight, having too much weight in the plane. So all of his bodyguards and entourage fly in a separate jet, and he flies in another jet. So he takes two jets in all the locations he travels to. Uh, as I mentioned, yeah. <laughs> as I mentioned, ninety million dollars he made in 2013, uh, all without endorsements. But he is known to have a, a superior work ethic. He they. People compare him to Kobe Bryant as far as his preparation goes for events. So he does take the fights very serious. He'll always be known to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning to train for hours. He has his own uh, personal chef with him to keep him on track. So he does, as eccentric as he might seem, he does is very dedicated to, um, to the matches in general. And just one last thing I wanted to mention about extravagant uses of money is that each mouth guard, mouth guards cost about $10, his mouth guards cost $25,000 a piece, because he gets them made with flecks of diamonds, or diamonds, gold flakes, and he actually has $100 bills put in to his mouth guard. <laughs> and there's actually a picture no here way. of his mouth guard with $100 bills inside of the mouth guard. <laughs> so as we prepare our, or go into our prepared speeches for today. You guys are all here. Yeah. <laughs> Our first speaker for today is Gus Davies. He's completed his competent communicator manual. He's completed his competent leadership bronze and is now working on the entertaining speaker manual. So project number two, speaking today, Gus Davies, speech title, Cross-Cultural Faux Pas. get your resources to entertain people? Where do you really look for it? It's everywhere. You know, it's like driving in here today. I see a car blue in front of me, and the color of the car, and the name of the car is Killed in Action. How many of you drive a Kia? <laughs> Kia, you know, you drive that car. I actually learned that from a military guy who was speaking. So when you drive that car, it's care killed in action. But every day around us, there are things that we can see that can bring resources in your home, at work, in your neighborhood, and all of these places, you encounter things that can really make life interesting. I'm going to be talking about cross-cultural blunders, how we get insensitive about things that happen. We just don't understand. Because this is the makeup of our lives. So in a cross-cultural faux pas, the blunders, the insensitivity, is because the things that make us up 
I am, I always tell people I'm not an African American. I am an African in America. Did you see the difference? So I become a citizen when I came here. I was not born here to say I'm an African American. Carol went over to London. She was going to do missionary work. She arrived there over the weekend. And the pastor decided that we have dinner together before her first visit to the church on Sunday morning. They had dinner. Carol had worked for a great company here at Disney, so she was very concerned about appearance the next day at church. Now, we realized some words that the British use are different from how we use it. So Carol is sitting down with the pastor. She really wants to know how is she going to look the next day. Because what we're, I'm wearing and the ladies wear, we call it here in England, they call it trousers. So Carol leaned over to the pastor and said, I just want to know if you will give me permission to wear pants tomorrow. Well, for the British, pants is actually your underwear. So you could just imagine this pastor is saying, why will my guest want me to give her permission to wear underwear? So do you see how those cross-cultural focus can happen? The wife of the pastor noticed and she quickly said, yes, 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 you have permission to wear pants. So when they wear pants over, over here, over there, they wear trousers. So that was her experience. She also learned that they told her when you get to England, you should always realize that your pants should match your jacket. So she was wondering all this time, how will the English people understand that, that your pants should wear, match your jacket? So she figured that out after that first day. Another thing that happens in England that is so different. When I first came to America 28 years ago, I lived in the South. So we had breakfast. They will do this thing they call gravy and biscuits. You know that? You know those people from the South? <laughs> gravy and biscuits. So Jamila goes to England. She's working at a golf club over there. And she wants to tell these English girls that they're going to go out for breakfast. And their breakfast, they're going to, she's going to have chicken and biscuits. And the English girls do say, why will you want to have biscuits for breakfast? You know, if you go to McDonald's or Wendy's, you can have, and they realize that biscuits for the English is not what we call breakfast biscuits. It's really, really what you will say here will be what, like crackers, mm -hmm. biscuits. So those are some of the cross-cultural things we never got into. She said, she decided when she came back to America that she is not going to have biscuits for breakfast. Some of you have also watched the movie Joy Lock Club. You know that movie? It's a great movie. It's this um, Chinese family. They live in America and she started to date an American girl. So they have this opportunity. Mom wants to meet her daughter's date. So when will you bring him to the house? Finally they decided when she was going to come to the house to have dinner with them. Mom was excited, she was trying to prepare the best dish for, you know, this gentleman that is coming to meet the family. Now in the Chinese culture, and some other cultures which make up our, our lives, they serve the best dish just in the middle of the dinner. So mom comes out and holds the dish like any mother, she's going to you know, be a little bit apologetic. Say, well, it's my best dish. This is the family history. We've got it from China. We now have it here. So we really want you to enjoy this dish. So she puts it in front because the guest, the boyfriend is the special guest. She puts it in front of him. Now in that culture, what he's supposed to do is to taste the food and really give compliments to the chef, the mom. She puts it there, he's the first, he takes it and pours it on his plate. He starts to eat it, mm, this needs more salt. It needs more salt and he starts to put more salt. And mom, he starts standing there, oh my goodness. And he actually abused the mom. Do you think that date went on? Yeah, he ate the food the way he wanted to. And mom just disappeared and went into the kitchen over the sink. And she was crying and crying and crying. Cross-cultural faux pas. 
One more cross-cultural folk poet. Lady went over to Yugoslavia as an exchange student. She, they picked her up from the airport, and it's going to be a long drive, about three hours. Well, when we come from America, whenever you arrive, you want to find what is the bathroom. And mm -hmm. so she wants to go to the bathroom. But her hosts were so excited, and she said, I want to go to the bathroom. Could you make a stop after 30 minutes? Well, they stopped at a place, and she thinks she has to go to the bathroom, to the toilet. Well, nobody really thought about it, so they gave her a bottle of Coke. And they said, have a Coke, you know, you're from America, you should be drinking Coke. And this lady is crossing her leg, and you know, you just feel like, oh, where's the bathroom, where's the bathroom? And finally, they said, are you sick, is something wrong with you? She said, I want to go to the toilet and the bathroom. Then they finally decided that, for them, it is not toilet, it is not bathroom, it is water toilet. closet, WC. And so finally she was really. So my fellow Toastmasters and guests, no guests, please be sensitive to the cultural <laughs> exchanges. Be sensitive that we all have difference and be able to apply yourself. Mr. Toastmaster. One minute on the clock, please, for evaluations. And the other boxer in this weekend's match is going to be Manny Pacquiao. He's, what I would like to say or characterize, probably more people's more likable by the Floyd Mayweather. Unfortunately, I don't really think he's going to win. I think it's going to go down. Nobody's going to wall up anybody, and I don't think there's going to be any knockout. It's going to go the distance, and while I'm fooling for Pacquiao, uh, when I, if I had to place a bet on it, I'd probably bet on, bet on Mayweather, but, but cheer for Pacquiao, because he's so much more just likable than Floyd Mayweather. Just to give you a, a idea of how the stature of these individuals, they're about my size and way less than I do. These two individuals, so that's, yeah. Or Manny Pacquiao is five, six, and they'll be boxing at around the 150 or so. They'll weigh in at about 150 or so. They're tiny, tiny guys. Uh, here fighting this way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the stack of money is taller than they are. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, he is the current welterweight champion. He's won the most. He's known as a boxer that's won the most championships in different weight classes. So he's been known to jump weight classes, add weight, drop weight, and win at each of these individual weight classes, which is extremely difficult for boxers to do. And he's been able to do it, at, I think, about seven different weight classes. Some of his nicknames include Pac-Man, which is what most people know him as, uh, the Executioner, the, <laughs> the Destroyer, Fighting Pride of Philippines, the Fighting Congressman, and the Filipino Slugger. He actually is a congressman. He was elected to Congress in 2010 in the Philippines. He also is the head coach of uh, Kia Sorrento, is the name of the team. <laughs> We have, that's a, key, that's a card over here, but over there, it's the name of a team called the Kia Sorrento. He's a head coach. He drafted himself also. So he, now he's also the first person and the oldest person to be drafted and play in a team and also be the head coach in the Philippines. So he's, he kind of does it all. He also had a little singing career for a while uh, in, on top of the politics. So he's, done, he's involved in a lot of different things. A very nice person overall. He, and he alone in his... The advertisements that he will have on his 
shorts that he will wear during the fight will net two and a half million dollars just on the logos he will wear on his pants during the fight. Our next prepared speech this morning comes from our, our president, Erica Benfield, and she's going to be speaking about how much, she's been doing these, these vlogs recently on top of her busy, busy schedule already, and one of her most recent vlogs, is you call it, is vlog or blog? Blog, vlog, is how much does an interior designer cost, and she'll be speaking about that topic this morning. Erica Benfield. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and we don't have any guests today. So according to the National Association of Home Builders, new homes are on the rise. As you can see, looking out the window, they're getting closer and closer, taking over as much land in our area. Family Circle last year rated Lake Mary in the top 10 cities to live in the nation. All of a sudden, corporations are bringing families over, and it seems like you most likely know one out of ten people that are moving into the area every week. How much does an interior designer cost? Well, I happen to be the founder of one of the top 20 firms in Orlando, according to the Orlando Business Journal report in April. And what does that mean to me? Well, for starters, the numbers are askew. They're a little lower than what they actually are. However, I like staying under the radar, and I'm proud to say that I've never worked for any of the other fellow walloping <laughs> competitors that are also privileged to be a part of that report. There are a various types of firms, decorators, that are available for hire. And I'm going to share with you what the difference is and how they charge so that you can decide how or who you want to hire. How do you research? Some people use their mobile device. How many of you use your mobile device when you're researching? How many use a desktop? There's a big difference because some websites are not mobile ready, but they are going to be according to the new Google algorithms that are going to go out very soon. They went up already, so they're last. <laughs> well, my website <laughs> happens to be mobile ready to be able to give the research that you need right at your fingertips. You can use a website called House, H O U Z Z, which my firm happens to have both badges that they give according to how many people save your image to their profile. You can access House and see millions of photos that are out on the web. However, I tell my clients, use it for inspiration, but if it's on there, it's already been done. You don't want to do that again. So how your research could be house. You can have a referral. You can have your realtor kind of guide you to where you go. So be wise in where you're getting this information. So if you want to use factual information, source, sources like the Orlando Business Journal, do a little research on Google. Now, today, you can also have social media. So for example, if you search interior design Lake Mary, you not only see my page on the Google Maps, but you also see my website. And then a little bit further, you're gonna see my Facebook. And a little bit further, you're probably gonna see a blog or blog that pops up. So I pretty much dominate that term. <laughs> <laughs> How your research matters. How designers charge is very different. So last year in the spring, I went to a continued education class in High Point, North Carolina, where a national speaker in our field was sharing a discussion about the new way of charging, which was flat rates. About 30 minutes into the presentation, I had to leave because I was dying on the inside because I've been charging flat rate fees since the beginning. But it gave me an aha moment that I am different and I'm not in the walloping competitor's way of thinking. So I put myself in the mindset of who is going to hire me and decided to write this blog. And it explains the difference. If you are a decorator and you work from home or an office, you don't get the accounts as a retail stocking dealer. You get what is called 
a designer discount. Therefore, your money maker is to charge hourly. By charging hourly, you're going to charge a rate, depending on your experience, of $100 to $150 an hour. When you hire someone with those credentials, you don't know how much time they're going to take because they could be a really fast designer or they could be a very thorough, slower, managing designer. How efficient are they getting things planned and processed and delivered for you? You're still being billed hourly no matter what. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. However, because of that continued education class in High Point, North Carolina, it, it dawned on me that there are people that still have to rely on that system. A flat base rate designer will charge you on average of $600 to $1,000 for 300 square feet. My rate is 700 and that is because I'm going to give them the information, I'm going to give them what they're asking for, and in return I'm going to specify products that we carry because you can buy them online in my online store, you can buy them in the physical store, and they're contacting us to find and source furnishings that they're not going to find in a regular box store. A box store such as Home Goods, Pier One, Hudson's, pick one and I'll tell you that we are not going to show those items on our floor. In the old days, you used to have to hire a designer based on the taste and the style that they had to kind of mirror their style. Today, we do the reverse, so we will find out what your style is, and we will design based on your budget and style needs. So to give you an idea that there is a quite, a quite a big difference on why they charge and the type of credentials that they have, feel confident that it's a relationship building process and do your research, find out how they charge, and know your budget when you're ready to contact us. Thank you. I believe that you have time for two to three minutes of questions from us. Yes. So. That sounds fantastic. So <laughs> ask away. I want to hear some questions in regards to my profession and how we hire, how we charge. I, I have a question. Suppose one just wants an evaluation of what's going on in their house and some sound suggestions without the entire package, like not wanting to buy those beautiful items that you have, maybe they can't afford it, maybe they want to get the downscale model from the box store, but they want your opinion, especially with the the swinche, I would be that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Do you do that or ever consider doing that? Well, that's a really good question to ask, Stephanie, and my answer to that is that I do get hired for paint consultations. I will charge on average about $300 based on the size of the home and how many areas, and we will give them in return large memo paint swatches that I spoke about in a previous speech in regards to being able to see the colors on the wall, and then we, we create a guide, and there's a blog about that as well on doing your paint swatches. A uh, paint schedule is what we call it. But if someone just wanted my brain, unfortunately, I'm not able to drive all over town and give someone that type of an opinion. You would probably hire someone that's a decorator that charges hourly. And the reason being is because we might see that room and it takes a lot of time to be able to draw and show you all the different versions and that can't be communicated verbally. So therefore, your best bet would be to hire me for a 300 square foot area, which is the equivalent of a living and dining room, and then you can get my brain and all the different versions of the, how that can look, and you're not obligated to buy at that point. You're just hiring us for the design. Thank you. Any other questions? What's the difference between, you mentioned the decorator and the interior designer? Well, that's a very good question, Gus, and that is the fact that in 2010, the state change the rules. You used to have to have an NCIDQ test or an IB license to call yourself an interior designer. And in that year, they changed it. So now you have pop-up stores such as Ethan Allen calling themselves interior designers. And what they do is they take your floor plan, they draw furniture, and they drop it in there, and they consider that interior design. However, 
now it's really difficult to know who has the right credentials. I am sponsored by a architect. I have the experience in years. I have an IB license since 2009. However, I know better that if I'm going to do a construction job, I want my other half, which is a 65-year-old super analytical architect. And he is my mentor. If I want to make changes, I will turn to him. So he's on our staff as a manager. But we don't focus so much on construction, but it's there if I need it. A decorator is not going to have an IB license or have that test. They don't have to, but they can call themselves an interior designer. Any other questions? Okay. No. I'm done. Go ahead on the clock, please, for about right now. <laughs> we'll think about it. Are you walloping that club? Sorry. Ah, you walloped it. Yeah. I have no idea what he's just talking about. <laughs> oh, play. Time we're going to go straight into everyone's favorite portion of the meeting, table topics. Good. And since everybody has roles, everybody is free game for our table topic master for today, Stephen Morgan, to pick up. Thank you, Jorge. Well, I'll try and spare the evaluators. They've got a bit to work on here. We got a few minutes to work with ourselves. We'll start with them. We've probably had an interesting time learning about boxing on this morning. Yes. <laughs> if you haven't been woken up yet, you probably need a jab to the face already. <laughs> but nonetheless, we've also had many phrases and words shift from the particular sport into our language, and sometimes we use them even on our everyday discussions. If you think about it then, When's the last time that you had to faint in order to avoid something coming at you? To faint, F-E-I-N-T. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> something to that effect, yes. Mm, we want that one. Carrie. <laughs> I pitch and my brother thinks I'm the dumbest person on the planet because I stand in front of guys that are being all back at me. I hear you. But, and, I, and I have managed to faint very quickly when the ball comes back at me. I don't always get out of the way. Uh, I have gotten hit many times, but I try to avoid that at all costs. <laughs> Saved by the bell, Samuel. <laughs> well, thank you for such an intriguing question, especially since the fact that I am a college student and <laughs> this happens all the time. I'll come into a class just a little late, or someone will come up right behind me, and I consider that being saved by the bell. Because if they are not, then I would have been the one who would have been scolded by the teacher if the other person had not come through the door right behind me. When did you last take a haymaker, Jorge? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, haymaker is when you get knocked out or uppercut, kind of a, oh. <laughs> a really big punch. I haven't Swung been in any, any fights <laughs> recently. Uh, <laughs> or for the past few years, at least not physical. But probably the last time I felt like I took a, a blow 
that I that kind of knocked me off was actually when I was I remember being at a at a theme park actually when I was it was in high school and uh, I somehow I, I tripped or I fell anyway and I hit my head on, on the side of this wall that was there and I kind of felt a little dizzy then but I got right back up and we rode roller coasters right after that <laughs> so I, that was probably the last time I, I really took a hit that, that kind of got me a little bit dizzy. But uh, I guess that's what happens when you're horse playing around in an amusement park that you probably shouldn't be doing that in. But, you know, I guess kids will be kids, right? <laughs> or boys will be boys, whatever. Uh, so that's the last time I, I took a hit up low like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. It's Bush Garden. <laughs> yeah. when, when did you feel like you took a sucker punch, Mike? Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I time I felt like I took a sucker punch. Let's see. It probably happened to me when I was at work. Not an actual sucker punch, but when someone sneaks up behind you or tells the boss, oh, hey, guess what Mike was doing. So you have to kind of think about preemptively what to say to circumnavigate and sidestep the wall up and which you're about to get so what I did doing my quick thinking was I blamed him for it. <laughs> I said he was a liar. Proved myself Ooh. right. Mr. Dustmaster. That's my <laughs> had his theme song, but what's your big motivating theme song, Julia? <laughs> 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 I'm about to devolve something that is personal and private. Not anymore. <laughs> when I talking about theme songs, it was the Rocky song that inspired yes. me to get my first job. And I have never been more teased by my family when I told my sister that was the mistake that I made. I told her that it was the Rocky songs. I was very afraid to go up to the Rexall Pharmacy where my sisters and my brother had worked because the pharmacist was very mean and nasty. <laughs> and I was afraid to go up to them. But I heard Rocky. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and that gave me motivation to get on my bike, ride up to the Rexall, and ask for the job, which I got. But after that, I will never live that down because now every time I see my sisters and my brother, they say, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> for today, Carrie Bird. <laughs> so we are now at our educational portion of our meeting and we will go ahead and start with our first evaluation, which will be Macarena Torres evaluating Gus Gibbs. very informative speech. It, it was such a pleasure listening to you talk. You spoke from the Entertaining Speaker Manual Number 2, Resources of Entertainment, and it, your purpose is to draw into entertaining material from sources other than your own personal experience, which you nailed. Thank you so very much for those wonderful stories that uh, supported your topic. You were very confident. I noticed that you didn't really need the podium. You, I don't even know if you used any notes. If you did, I didn't even notice. You were very comfortable, very relaxed, very, what's the word, comfortable in your skin. You knew what you were talking about. You seem to be very experienced very uh, knowledgeable in, in this area. The talk was very interesting. You were very well prepared. You made a great eye contact. You walked around. You see, I saw that you noticed you made eye contact with everybody here. 
one thing I would suggest, I noticed that you supported your material with four stories. One thing I would suggest is minimize it to three. And something I would have also liked for you to talk about was how to avoid confusion when traveling. I know this because I did quite a few tra uh, traveling trips myself, and I had to educate myself on the culture before traveling so as to not make those mistakes. Because yes, they do. I went to England, I went to Italy, and they use different words for different things, and it didn't want to create confusion, such as trousers and pants. So I really did have to educate myself in order to av avoid confusion on their end because I am in their country and I have to adjust to their ways and not assume that they know the American side of things. So it would be great for, uh, it, it would have been very good to know how to avoid those, those um, bits of confusion. But other than that, you did a wonderful job at, at uh, ed educating us on, on the culture because there are a lot of people that have not traveled and they don't know. So it, it, it was very informative, very uh, great to hear a, a, such a wonderful speech and I hope to hear more. Thank you. Thank you. could wallop us with an off-the-cuff speech this morning, it is Erica Benville, and that she did. She was speaking from the Speaking to Inform fact-finding report, and then she told us about a lot about interior designing as opposed to decorating. It was a combination of reports, so I thought. Very interesting. She told us the reason the influx of new homeowners and people moving into this area, new homes being built. Lake Mary is one of the top 10 cities in the country to live, and I've seen that a few times. Was it organized? It really was. Off the cuff and organized. There were no visual aids, because she didn't know she was speaking this morning. There was enough information to know whether we can afford her or not. <laughs> we <may> need, <laughs> even if we need her, but there was enough information to know whether we can afford it. Quickly do the math on your square footage times three, 700. Yes. Okay. How did she handle the Q&A after being reminded there was a Q&A? Very well. She fielded those questions like a pro. It's her industry. She knows and loves it. That comes through. What you could have done a little better, a little differently? Not much, except for to be careful of the industry jargon. There was a string of terms that you threw out there, and I was looking to see if I was the only one that didn't quite catch that, and I couldn't get it quick enough into my little thing over there. So I'm going to ask you to repeat that again. <laughs> Just the industry, you know, we all don't know those insider terms. And what did I like best? The fact that you were able to get up in a second and really a couple of minutes notice and to deliver such valuable information, such insightful information, and complete on interior designing, and that's a great, great plus. I thank you so much for that, Madam General Evaluator. Seven six twenty outstanding. Carrie, you had fifteen seconds on your topic. I'm disappointed in you. Sam, twenty one. Come up short. 
Jorge, 30 at 9. <laughs> Me, 35, right in the window where it needs to be. <laughs> and Julia, 59. Perfect. Hey, Perfect. hey, hey. Mac had 253, and Stephanie had 220, and that is my report. I need to add a slide in there for myself right here. There we go. Sam, I have an odd just now and a pause. Thank you, Mike, for catching that earlier. Gus, you had one like, and that was it. Erica, you had two pauses and one double clutch. Carrie, you had one but and two ands. Mike, you show off, you had none. Julia, you just had one double clutch. Julia, Macarena, I am sorry you are our money maker today. Yes. You have four ums, two us, one so, one but, one and. The main thing was the lip smacks. You had nine of those, two pauses, and three double clutches. Stephanie, you just had one little tongue click and a pause, and that was it. And you were more so gathering your thoughts on that pause, so I don't know if that even counts. That's exactly what you got. Oh, okay, yes. there we go. Yeah, so, yeah, well, thank, well, thank you for the readers. <laughs> <laughs> and that is my report. Okay, and then as a general report, the room was set up, everything looked great. Well, hey, did a good job. The only thing I'm going to comment on, because I know Stephanie was giving looks, was the amount of varies. Oh. Everything was very good or very this, yeah. so try to watch that. It's similar to using the word great. And also, when you are at the podium and are leaving, like always you. shake somebody's hand. Oh, it should be when you come up and when you leave. And it's the lecture at the podium. It's a lecture. Maybe you are correct. Anyway, now we are to we're Oh, it's on Carrie's desk. Was it? I wasn't there. Alright. <laughs> so, a couple things of business is that we have an upcoming district conference. How many of you are thinking that they just want to go, maybe haven't signed up, or are planning to attend? What, and see Stephanie do the big stage? Come on. Oh, oh come on. What? I think come we on. need to support Stephanie. Going. We can carpool. We can figure out a way to get there. So I want to plan to see. It's at the Florida Mall. There's a Florida hotel there. It's still 45 minutes. So if you want to drink, we can figure out a way to do that. I think there's going to be cocktails there, right? Free. Oh, yeah. yeah. Free. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead and make that promise. <laughs> I, I can. I will write a tab. I'm drinking. Very good. Before, Pop during, and after, I'll be drinking. What day? Don't get sauce. It's what day? May 29th. May 29th and 30th. May 29th and 30th. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Saturday. 
So, in a previous speech, I shared about the conference that I went to called the Designers Bloggers Conference, and it was very, very interesting. I've made friends very that nice. I still keep up, and therefore I'm blogging and video blogging, which we call blog, every week. So it makes it real easy to pick up an off-the-cuff speech. However, that was last month, so it's a miracle that I remembered all that. But if there is a jargon term that I use, can you tell me so that I'm careful? Because when you are speaking in front of camera or you're pitching to the media, they tell us not to use jargon terms. So can you tell me what I said? The license. Very. Something with a Q. <laughs> the license. The ID license. Yes. Yes. As in something else. Is okay. Something okay. NCIDQ. NCIDQ. Yes. 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 Okay. There was when you were differentiating between yourself. And no, we don't have tomatoes. And the <laughs> yourself and the other guys. It, there was a term that I used, something with an S. <laughs> it went by me so quickly. Yeah. But it was okay. right in there. Well, somewhere. it's on video, so I'll go back, go back and over. see it. Yeah, because I, I need to make sure I don't use those terms. So what I would recommend for, for that one would just yeah, uh, explain, explain yes. it. Right. Because mm -hmm. then it makes okay. us feel more informed mm -hmm. that you really are letting us into the inside of your With business and it builds forward. a better ground of trust right. for the sales pitch because that's appeared to me what you were doing. Right. So whenever you have someone who is selling something, you want to be able to make sure that they fully understand everything. Right. I agree. It's just within the I agree. Website. I always kind of joke, though, that it's the way that the government gets their money. Mm -hmm. So I yeah, have sure. about four licensures on my wall in Lake Mary's store. The little tiny Chachki store in Orlando has four permits. Four. Okay. And the insurance is just as much as if it was a traditional box store. So. You know, you got to pay the piper, but they are regulating our industry, and I'll be careful about that. Um, anyway, besides that, anybody else blogging or video blogging that they are, because it's a big, I'm not doing it for money, I'm just doing it for Google. <laughs> to give you the answers. I've been putting two clubs up for a bit. Two clubs. Yeah. Maybe them at my office, but I don't. I haven't done oh, any right. specifically that we we have in our office. Okay. Well, I'm la I'm ad living here because I still have a little bit of time, but I will say this: all the speeches that you have, if they are related to your industry, one of the biggest things that I took away from that conference, and it was probably about four grand to to attend. So it was a very wow. exclusive elite set of people, wow. kind of bloggers that do this for a living. Like that is how they pay for them, their their lifestyle. And in order for Google to stay on top, you have to give away your knowledge. People are using Google to search. How do I do this? Or what does this cost? Or blah 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 blah. So one of the keynote speakers said to to not. Think about what you want to sell, but think about what people are, are answering. So whether you enjoy it and are retired and want to speak to inform through the web, consider that as a way if you've ever contemplated having your own business or want to share your knowledge or even want to get paid as a speaker someday. You have to start somewhere. So blogging is the now and the future in order for Google to continue and dominate. What does it take you to blog? Well, some of the suggestions are, in order for it to be ranked, because none of my competitors understand this, they're all doing about two to 300 words, personal opinions, things like that, sharing about projects. But you want to make sure that a blog is a minimum of 500 words. So if you use WordPress on the bottom, it tells you how many words, or there's ways that you can submit something that you write on Word and it'll tell you how much, how many words there are in there. When we're speaking about something that we really want to rank up for, we won't do anything less than 800. So, and obviously I can't do everything, you know, founder of this, founder of that, four kids. So I sometimes will have a blog started, I'll give someone direction and then I'll rewrite it and then submit it. So not everyone, Martha Stewart doesn't write her own blogs, you know, Bunny mm -hmm. Williams doesn't write her own blogs. So it's just a matter of making sure that the angle and the voice is that of your company. But I, I am very active and I do write and everything has my hand on it. And therefore, I'm able to grow and do as much as I can. But if you think that you your information is valuable, which I think it is, every time somebody's speaking up here, 
I'm learning something new. And that's what makes Toastmasters so captivating. We're all here to encourage each other on the path of feeling more confident in speaking. However, it's no longer just speaking in public. It's now speaking in front of thousands. And another tip, when I was at the High Point Furniture Market last week, I got to sit in front of the Chief Creative Director for Wayfair. Anybody know who Wayfair is? Yes. Wayfair is like the Walmart of online, basically. Wayfair started selling way back when, and they're not very good at making sure all companies that, that are, they're promoting are what we call minimum advertised price, but if it's out there, they're gonna have it, most likely. And what I took away from that keynote discussion is the amount of transactions that are gonna increase in the next 10 years online. So they shared with us about how the increase of using your smart device, how better it's gonna to get to shopping online, and I could probably write a speech on that, but I don't wanna scare people because it's all about generational. You know, it's the ones that are in their 20s that maybe aren't gonna know what it's like to buy their own toilet paper in the store. <laughs> Amazon just came out with a button. Has anybody seen the button? You can put it on anything. For example, your washing machine, there's a button and you push it, links to an app, and your paper towels will arrive like the next day. I mean, it's ridiculous, yeah. Um, but my point in saying that is that out of that speak, and talk, going back to speaking, she mentioned something called Periscope. Does anybody know what Periscope is? Well, no. Okay, well that's the layman term for Periscope. A Periscope is a submarine binocular, basically, yeah. that you look through and then it pops up over the water and you can see far. A Periscope, to me, sure. is an app that connects to Twitter and it produces a live broadcast. So if you can imagine, I have over 3,300 followers on Twitter. I didn't, really didn't take Twitter so seriously until recently, but I'm only following like 200 something people. So whatever I tweet obviously is important enough that 3,000 plus people care. And it's because of Toastmasters and the, you know learning about what registers when you speak. <laughs> um, but Periscope is an app on your phone. You click on it and you can live broadcast from anywhere and it stays on the app for 24 hours. You can lock it and you can have a set number of people join your broadcast. So if you want to do it for work or with friends and you just want to communicate live broadcast, you can do that. But it is an amazing, amazing tool and I think that in the future, my personal opinion is that people are going to want to get more of the raw information versus the doctor you know, broadcast television version more and more. They want to feel a part of the experience and in order to do that, you know, you have the personal assistants periscoping, there's the professional camera and then there's the speaker on the television. And you can write your own opinions and everybody can see it. So that's my little weird knowledge that I have <laughs> with me today and the schedule for next week. We have the Toastmaster Stephanie, Speaker one, Martin. Speaker two, Jorge. Speaker three, Steven. <coughs> Woohoo! Full day. Table topics: Ernst, General Evaluator Julia, Mike Hughes, Evaluator, Evaluator two, Carrie, Ah Counter, Gus Davies, Grammarian Erica, myself. Timer, Macarena. Any other comments and group discussion? Where's my balance? Right next to Everyone have a great week. Thank you. We didn't I'm so do sorry, Jorge.